Hey, good morning. Welcome to Pastor Paul's Bible Talk. This is what we do on Saturday, sort of our sermon of the week for those of us who are learning a new way to walk out this 21st century spirituality. And my question today is, there a God in heaven who's just pissed at humanity? And has there ever been a worse theology than a group of people who will tell everyone that God is just angry and they're dirt and they're just lucky that if Jesus would just help them and screen them off from this terrible God in heaven, they might just survive and not go to a lake of fire by the skin of their teeth? Has there ever been a more damaging theological belief in the history of the world? I have friends that talk about communism being bad, socialism, Marxism, and yes, I think terrible things have been done in the name of isms in the world. But has anything been more dangerous than to tell us that we're dirt and horrible people? I don't think so. But let's talk about it today on Pastor Paul's Bible Talk. All right. Happy Saturday, everyone. Welcome to Pastor Paul's Bible Talk. Glad you're with me. And for those of you who survived Thanksgiving, I, I hope there are people out there that love Thanksgiving and thrive on it and have family. And it's a wonderful, wonderful time. I know far too many people uh, like myself that find Thanksgiving to be something to endure. And I, I pray that that wasn't your story over the last week. And if it is your story, that you were able to find um, your tools to get through it and get through it well. Um, again, I think we've been taught so much bad theology over the years that it creates these really bad family dynamics and make things like holidays very difficult. And for those of you who are indigenous people or people of color or support uh, those groups of people and find Thanksgiving to be a holiday that is difficult uh, because of uh, historically difficult. My heart is with you today as well. And I just pray for all of you to have a blessing. And I share my energy, hope, and love and spirit with you today. And we're going to talk about the theology of sin and God being pissed at the world and what was written sort of in these Old Testament stories and now has carried on today to uh, sort of traditional Christianity and particularly evangelicalism, where it's this idea, in, in the, the, the tradition I grew up in in the church was, God is awesome. He's given us all the grace uh, to get to go to heaven one day. And all you have to do is follow all of his rules and be Christian and be us and look like us and think like us and vote like us. And that's all you have to do. And then God may not smite you with lightning from heaven. I, I mean, and, and my evangelical friends would say, that's not our theology. Other than it's the way you live and treat people. You're right. It's not your theology, but it is actually how you live and execute your theology. And to give you an example of this, let me show you uh, a TikTok video that I did uh, recently that just sort of emphasized this point of the theology of God being pissed, of the rapture and being left behind, and how much pain this inflicts on human beings. Let's watch it now. Listening to rock and roll music will get you left behind and sent straight to hell. At least that's what I was told as a kid, and I believed it. Remember these guys? Kiss kings and Satan service. We were even made as kids to bring our records and cassettes to a record-breaking service at our church and smash our records and cassettes on the altar. Wow, do I miss that Barry Manilow cassette tape I smashed. One night, my friend played the song Beth on the jukebox at Pizza Hut, sung by this guy named Peter Chris, the drummer for Kiss, and he has to be evil because, I guess, Satan likes cats? I prayed through the whole song that Jesus wouldn't come because I liked the song, but I knew if Jesus came back and raptured us at that moment, I would be left behind as a 12-year-old and then required to make a life and death decision of whether to take the mark of the beast or not. Beautiful Christian teaching, isn't it? And the sad thing is it's not teaching that's backed up by the Bible. The parable of the Minas tells us of a servant who thought the master was harsh and evil. And because he thought that, he didn't even think about investing the gifts given to him into others. 
But the other followers of the master clearly thought he was somebody that wanted them to risk and invest their gifts into others and receive reward. And the master said to the first guy, because this is what you believe about me, I'm going to take everything you have and give it to the other guys. Jesus said, if you've seen me and read my story, you know who God is. And Jesus never displayed the characteristic of being someone who wants to throw a 12-year-old into hell for liking a song. Hell is a teaching of evangelicalism that gives people permission to be self-righteous and feel better than others and be a terrible person towards others and blame it on God. And it's a teaching that has heaped shame and terror on young people for decades and generations. And those who teach it need to learn the real Bible and the real story of Jesus and need to hear from me shame on you. So that's the theology of evangelicalism, certainly the theology and the tradition that I grew up in. And I like to do something here in Bible talk is I, I find the Bible to be fascinating and filled with wisdom and love it. But I also understand it's a it's a book written by an ancient group of people, particularly in the Old Testament, who were doing their best to interpret who God is. And I like to take those scriptures and display to evangelical people and to those of you who are walking away from your Christian tradition that you don't have to believe, even from the evangelical Protestant scripture itself, the way we've been taught to believe that very, very damaging theology of that TikTok that, oh, if you just displease God at just the wrong moment as a 12-year-old, you're suddenly going to have to make an eternal decision between eating and going to hell forever or getting your head chopped off and, and being able to go to heaven for eternity. What a terrible, terrible thing to teach young people. And it's it's done more damage than anything that's ever been taught in the history of the world, I believe. And by the Protestant scriptures themselves, it is a bad theology. And let me explain that to you today, because I believe what we see in the story of the Bible, if you follow the Bible from, from start to finish, and by the way, it's not a linear book. It wasn't written by Americans in linear thinking. And so don't get me wrong that I'm saying that. But even in the story itself, what we see is, I believe, evangelical. Catholic, you know, sort of this Christian exclusive theology is wrong, even by their own scriptures. And I want to show that to you today, because I believe what we're seeing in the book is a, a spirit of heaven, a spirit of the divine that was defined as this patriarchal God by these ancient Hebrew people. Uh, wanted a partnership with humanity. It was the, the story that is radical of the Old Testament is a people determined they were going to be monotheistic. They were going to serve one God. There were many gods available to follow uh, at the time. And they chose one and their God didn't want to be at odds with their enemies. Their God wanted everyone to know there was a goodness of heaven that would draw humanity to our best selves. And, and that God, that spirit wanted to work through this group of people to display that to the whole world. And that group said, nah, we would rather hate our enemies and have a God that hates our enemies than a God that loves people that we don't like. And, and by the way, that is the evangelical mindset of today. It's like, we want a God that hates the people that we hate. We want a God that excludes the people we exclude. We don't want a God that loves people that we don't love. And that's the problem uh, in much of our culture in the West today. So let me show you where what that looks like in the Bible. And we start with this covenant. Now, a covenant is sort of like a contract. It's a treaty, if you will. But in the days, uh, in biblical days, in these ancient times, we're talking about covenant was, it was much more than a contract. It was, you know, you died if you didn't follow the covenant. It was a, a life commitment together. And we see in Genesis 19, the story of this divine presence of God, which they saw as this patriarchal being, making a covenant with humanity, saying, I don't want to be pissed at you. I want to be in partnership with you. And it's going to be a radically new relationship between a human being and a God, if you will. And so let's let's read that from the Bible so that uh, you can see that I'm not uh, making it up as we go. And so those of you watching on YouTube, uh, you can see it on the screen. In Genesis 15, and I'll just start reading some, and, and you guys can read the whole passage. I'll read parts of it. You can go back and check me out yourself. But Genesis 15, we see this guy, 
Abraham, he, initially as Abram, uh, this this unknown God that he had no idea who it was came to him and said, I want you to leave the land of your father. I want you to leave your father's gods behind. And I want you to go travel someplace that you don't know where you're going. And, and Abram said, okay. And then his name was changed to Abraham on the way. Now, Abraham had no sons. And so therefore his wealth was going to pass to like his top aide. But this new God that he had found that he was now like following around in traveling was telling him, no, no, you're going to have an heir, even though you're very old, we're, we're going to get you on. And so they have this discussion in Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, 5, it says, and God brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he, God said to him, Abraham, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it. God counted it to him as righteousness. So right off the bat, Genesis 15, 6, a verse that we then see repeated in Romans 5 says, Abraham was has righteousness. Abraham gets to go to heaven. Abraham is in right relationship with God, not because he prayed a sinner's prayer, not because he, he uh, counted himself devoted to Jesus Christ, but because he just understood the partnership with heaven that he was going to be walking in. It was counted to him as righteousness. So right off the bat, this is telling us this idea that you that of religious exclusivity of Christianity, that nobody but Christians can possibly be in right relationship with God or go to heaven with God is discounted right there. And by the way, again, this verse is repeated in Romans 5, the book that says, no, you don't get to heaven and you don't get to be in right relationship with God by you know, just say in a sinner's prayer, it is it is this partnership with the divine and with heaven. And, and he, Abraham, believed the Lord and God counted it to him as righteousness. And God said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, which was his Abraham's father's land, to give you this land to possess. And, and so let me skip forward a little bit here. Well, I'll go right here. And 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 he, Abraham, said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess this? And he, God, said to Abraham, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he, Abraham, brought all of these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. Let me skip to verse 12. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dread, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions." And then to verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. On that day, the Lord, this divine God of heaven, made a covenant with Abram, a man, saying to your offspring, I give this land. So what's happening there? That's kind of this weird thing happening where God is telling Abraham, you know, go grab these animals, cut them in half, lay them out, and let's uh, figure out what we're doing together here in this covenant. So what, what that was, was a representation of what is called a parity covenant. It is a covenant between two equal people of equal power, like two families would decide we're going to come together as one family and we're going to take care of each other. We're going to share everything. And so they would cut these animals in half and lay them out in sort of this path on the ground. Why they didn't just write up, you know, they didn't just have paper ready with a notebook to write a contract up. So they would cut these animals up and lay them on the ground. And the two heads of the household would walk together through between those animals. And the symbolism was, if I violate this covenant or anybody in my family violates this covenant with your family, may it happen to me as happened to these animals. May I be cut in half as these animals were cut in half. And so the two heads of household would walk through and they would say, we are equal partners and we are now one group of people. And if either side um, violates this covenant, then the head of that household will be cut in half uh, because of uh, you know the symbolism of the covenant. Now, there was another, and so what happened here then is in the story sort of we see the idea that God put Abram to sleep 
and then this torch and flaming pot pass through the pathway. And so the symbolism of this is God is, is saying all of, all of this idea of sin, all of this idea of rules and law that are going to punish you are being taken care of. God himself in the story as written by these ancients is passing through for the covenant and saying, if I violate the covenant, let me be chopped in half like these animals. And if you and your people violate the covenant, also let it happen to me like these animals. It is it is a, a story of the goodness of heaven saying, now heaven and man are going to walk in partnership together. No longer is it going to be like a God giving the rules and people following them or else. Now it's going to be heaven and earth walking together. As Jesus said, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Let, let the kingdom of heaven advance on earth. It's a whole different concept than, oh, we worship God. And if we do it just right and we join just the right denomination of Christianity, maybe God will let us into heaven. Maybe God will protect our kids. Maybe God won't strike us with cancer. That, that's It's a totally different story than that. And we see in the story written in the Protestant Bible, Abraham believed there was this good spirit of heaven that he could partner with and walk with, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't pray a sinner's prayer down on his knees and do that and, and get to go to heaven because of it. It's a very, very different story than the very damaging theology of, of Protestantism. So now you would say, but there are hundreds of rules in the Bible, hundreds of them. Why, you know, how can you say this, Paul? Well, here's what happened is Abram and his people followed God in this sort of belief system. And then that covenant was changed, not by God, but by human beings. And that happened in Exodus 19. So let's go back and look at the Bible again and see what happens. Because what happens is God proposes to this group of people, I'm going to, this, this, presentation of this goodness of the divine spirit of heaven is going to partner with you and you're going to be the ones to walk it out in Abram's family and then in his son Isaac and in Jacob. And, and now uh, in Exodus 19, we see God promote, proposing this to a whole group of people. And, and sadly, human beings end up saying, hell no, to this agreement because they want something different. And we'll see that in Exodus 19. So uh, this is now the, the Israelites have come out of Egypt. Uh, they're, they're traveling around the desert and they uh, now have come to Mount Sinai, which is a very significant mountain in the history of uh, the, in biblical history. And so it's talking about after they've come out, they're at Sinai, they're camping there. And it says uh, that Moses went up to talk to God. And then in Exodus 19, 4, we start to read. And, and this is God talking to Moses and says, if you will indeed obey my voice or heed my voice, listen to me, if you will listen to me and keep my covenant. So he's saying, keep the covenant that I made with Abraham, with Abram, your, your father, the, the head of your lineage also the head of Ishmael's lineage, by the way, the Muslim people, the, all three, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all come from Abraham, from the same, same guy. And God is saying, if you will listen to me and obey my voice, heed my voice, and keep that covenant that I made with Abraham, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine. Now, is God saying here, you're going to be an exclusive people better than everybody else? Or is he saying you're going to be a special group of people? And we learn what that means exactly in, in verse 6 here of Exodus 19. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God's not saying you're going to be a better people than everybody else. He's saying what's going to be special about you is you're going to be this group of people. You're going to, you're going to be a monotheistic people, not polytheistic like the people around you. And you're going to be, all of you are going to be in relationship with this divine spirit of heaven, you're all going to be in relationship, not just the high priest, like every other culture around you, you're going to be set apart because you're going to have a different belief system than everybody. And your God is going to be different than their gods. Because why? Because he loves them too. Everybody around you, all the people around you have 
have polytheistic gods that set rules and they try to follow them because if they do, then their gods will kill their enemies and make their plants grow. And so they're going to sacrifice their firstborn to those gods. They're going to sacrifice a bunch of their, uh, their crops to those gods because they need a god to protect them and kill their enemies. But you guys are going to be connected to the full goodness of heaven. You're going, to, you're going to go to your neighbors and say, we don't want to be enemies anymore because we have this amazing God that loves everyone, that wants everyone to be better, that wants all the world to be better. And it's going to be incredible that you're going to tell these people of this whole new way to look at the relationship between humanity and the divine. And the Israelites are like, that sounds kind of cool. All right, let's think about it. And then they come back and make a really heinously bad decision. And ultimately in Exodus 20, let me show this to you. Um, they decide, nah, we're, we're good. Um, they come back in Exodus 20, verse 19, and say, God, you seem not like the kind of God that we want. And they said, so tell you what, we want to have a relationship with you. You seem like a, a pretty awesome God. So we want to have a relationship with you, this ancient group of people are saying. But we want our relationship with you to be the same as our neighbors are with their God, because we want to have a God that we can manipulate to kill our enemies. We want to have a God that we can manipulate to make our plants grow. And we don't want to have to go tell our neighbors that you're good and love them. Just, you know, we see this. Uh, and so let me read the verse and then I'll explain a little bit more. In verse 2018, it says, when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and smoke and you know they were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. So they had a chance to be in partnership with God. Now they're like, nah, God, this doesn't sound like a great idea. And in verse 19, uh, the people said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. They're like, nah, we don't want that relationship with a God. We want the same relationship our neighbors have. And it was called a vassal covenant. Now, God had proposed to Abram a parody covenant where two equal partners are walking in covenant together. And Abraham had said, great idea, let's do it. And the Bible said, Abram believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was in right relationship with heaven. Then we have the Israelite people here that God is now saying, instead of just with this one family of Abram, it's gonna be with all of you and all of you are gonna be a priest and it's gonna be amazing. Um, then uh, the people said, nah, we wanna have a relationship with God like our neighbors do and uh, have them be, uh, have you be a God that we can manipulate like yours do. So let me show you why then in the New Testament that we also agree that it's, that was not what God wanted to do. But uh, let me take a quick break. And when I come back, I'll show you more about that here on Pastor Paul's Bible Talk. For those of you on YouTube, we'll let you see ways that you can jump in and be a part of the uh, Pastor Paul community all week long and how you can support what we do. Be back with you in just a minute. We're talking about the terrible theology of evangelicalism, of left behind, 
a pissed God that is constantly wanting to condemn us of our sins, whereas I see in the Bible a, a divine spirit of the goodness of heaven that's saying, I want to walk in partnership with you. And so that spirit came to Abraham in the Protestant Bible in the Old Testament, the Jewish uh, text that we use as our Old Testament in the Christian scripture, and is saying, all right, Abram, I'm going to solidify and covenant this partnership with you, and we're going to walk together as equal partners in a parity covenant. But then uh, God then goes to the Israelites in Exodus 19 and says, now I want to do it with you all as a people. You're going to have a God who loves your neighbors, who loves your enemies, and is going to encourage you to do the same. Sorry, my yard guys are here outside now, so I hope it's not too loud in the background. And the people of Israel make the terrible mistake of saying, no thanks, we want to have a God that hates our enemies and hates the same people we do. Don't we all love it when the dogs join our live broadcast? And, and we see this in the book of Jonah, and someday I'll, I'll come back and talk on Jonah in Jonah chapter four, that Jonah is saying, I don't want to follow and be connected to a spirit of heaven that loves the Ninevites. I want to have a God who wants to kill the Ninevites. And isn't it the same way with the Protestants today? Now, we may not say we want we want God to kill our enemies, although some do verbalize that out. But we want, as Protestants or as Catholics or as Mormons, we want to worship a God that hates the same people that we hate. If we're, if we're anti-gay, we want God to be anti-gay and we make the scriptures to be anti-gay. Or if we're, we're uh, extremist, anti-abortionist, then we want God to hate the Democrats. Um, that we, we like Jonah, like the Israelites at Sinai are saying, no, we want to worship a God that hates our enemies the same way we hate our enemies. We, we want God to be a Republican like we are. And, and so in Exodus 19 and 20, and then the following, uh, all of the following history until the story of the New Testament of Jesus is then in the story of the Bible, God is saying, don't you understand that what you're doing is leaving a parody covenant where we're walking together and you're moving into what was known then as a vassal covenant. A vassal covenant would be like a people of that day would feel like they were threatened in war. And so they would go to a neighboring king and they would say, we need you to protect us because we're going to be killed by our enemies. And that king would then say, OK, I will protect you. And in exchange, you're going to pay taxes to me. You're going to follow my laws. I am now in charge of your people. You, I am your vassal and you are... Uh, sort of the substandard uh, subhuman species that I now control. And in doing so, I will keep you safe. And that's the covenant that the that the people of Israel in the desert chose. They said, now we don't want this parody covenant that Abram have. We want you to hate our enemies. So we will enter into a vassal covenant. And so in the, the story, as it's written in the Bible, uh, then God says, okay, bad idea, but here you go. Here's 600 rules to follow. Enjoy. And if you don't follow them, you know, where before we were in a partnership and and if you didn't do right, I would kind of say, come on, let's do better. But now if you do something wrong, the ground will open up and it'll swallow you up or I'll send a plague and kill 3000 of you or something really terrible will happen. Now we're in a vassal covenant that you chose human beings, not it wasn't God's plan. It was the human plan. You want to have this covenant because you want to be able to manipulate heaven to manipulate your enemies. This is the Protestant belief system. Protestants today are saying the same, even though we put it in better terms of the grace of Christ, we're still in, but we have to be Christian or else. And by the way, since we have entered into this relationship whereby we have to be Christian or else, then we get to hate those that aren't Christian. We get to look down upon them. And, and my Christian friends would say, we don't hate. But what you do is you're, you're, you're excluding. You're saying, you're not us. We're God's people. And you're not us if you don't have our same belief system. So it's the exact same decision that was made by the Israelites at Sinai in Exodus 19 for Protestants to make today. And I think what's a really important thing to understand in the story is that was not God's choice. It was, it was not God that created the earth and said, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to have to put my son on the cross and beat the hell out of him so that people don't go to hell. It was man's choice. That, that religion, that religious system is 100% man-made, not God created, 
man-made and the and the religion of the Protestant church today is a human construct that isn't the choice of heaven for us to live in. The story is very different in heaven. And let me show you what that looks like in the New Testament of the Protestant Bible, that the Protestant Bible itself states this story in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And it says, hey, this Protestant religion that you live by, this idea of you know, blood sacrifice to wash our sins away so we can go to heaven was never God's idea. It's always been a human construct. So human te uh, Hebrews 10.1 says, for since the law. So what happened when Moses uh, and the people then entered into this vassal covenant with God, then God says, okay, now that we're in a vassal covenant, I have to give you my law. Here's 600 rules you have to follow. Good luck with that. That was called the Mosaic law, the law that was given to Moses. And so now Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament of the Protestant Christian Bible is saying, for since the Mosaic law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings. You take no pleasure. Then I, Jesus said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written for me in the scroll of the book. Uh, when he said, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in those burnt offerings. And we go down towards where we get to what was the plan of God in Hebrews 10, 16. It says, this is the covenant. Remember that covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, we call it if we want to sound smart, that covenant that I will make with them, like I made with Abraham, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. So what this passage is saying is the idea that killing a lamb to get rid of sins was never a good idea, and it was never God's idea. It was a human construct within the choice to be in this vassal covenant rather than this e equality covenant. So Hebrews 10 is saying, this idea of killing bulls and goats never got rid of sin. You're, you're ridiculous to think. And this idea of praying a sinner's prayer and it gets rid of your sins, that, that was never God's idea. Never. The idea was walking in partnership with heaven, with the divine, with letting this goodness, uh, a, a good spirit that's bigger than ourselves, drive us forward. And out of that, it would be credited to us as righteousness, as in the relationship of God and Abram. That's what the, the spirit of heaven has always wanted to do is enliven us with goodness so that we could do, as Jesus said, make it on earth as it is in heaven. Not like be shitty people and someday get to go to heaven because we prayed a sinner's prayer. No, our job is to walk in partnership with this divine spirit of heaven and bring goodness to earth and advance the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's a completely different belief system. And, and I say like, this evangelical belief system that I grew up in, not only it doesn't, it doesn't just need to be tweaked a little bit. It isn't just a little bit offline. It's 100% incorrect. It is, it is 100% the bad choice that the Israelites made at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And God was, you know, this this passage in Hebrews 10 is saying when you have a written code, a bunch of rules like. Don't drink, don't chew, don't smoke, and don't date girls that do. What, what is it? Don't don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, and don't date girls that do. It, all that does is remind us of our sin. It doesn't take away sin. It makes us feel like sinners. It doesn't rise us to another level to be better human beings. It makes us worse human beings by telling us we're sinners. And it is the basis of evangelical belief system. And for your Catholic, you Catholics and Mormons and others, you may say, yep, ours too. The basis of the system is to tell you that you're crap. 
And, and amazingly, then when we're told that, we live down to that. And my evangelical friends would tell me, no, we're trying to be better because we're not smoking and chewing or dating girls that do. We're telling homosexuals that they're, they're going to hell and we're better people than we were before. You're not. You're not. The truth is you're trying to placate an angry, pissed off God with your actions so that you get to go to heaven and that guy over there doesn't. Unless you can manipulate him with your prayer, your witchcraft of prayer to come and join your belief system. It's a terrible belief system. You believe in a pissed off God and he's pissed off at you and, and, and then you want to placate him with your actions and prayers, but you hope that he's more pissed at the next guy than pissed at you. It's a terrible theology. It destroys the hearts and spirits of young people. And it is being manifest in the culture all around us every day today. You see these terrible people. We always see these videos of these terrible people in the airports or in Target. And inevitably, when I see these videos, I go, I bet this person is a Christian. And they'll, you know, at the end, they'll be like, I'm going to pray for you. And you're like, holy crap, when did we become these terrible, terrible people in our culture? It's because we made a choice to be in a vassal covenant with a God that gives us rules and we can placate those rules to try to survive, but then we get to say, okay, God, because I'm placating you with my actions, I want you to hate my enemies. I want you to hate the same people we hate. And when we have a God that hates the same people that we hate, we are worshiping a God that we've created, not the true spirit of goodness of heaven. I believe there's something divine that's bigger than the universe and is saying, connect humanity with that and you're going to be better people. You're going to be people that are willing and able to live self-sacrificially. You're going to be people that want to, want to draw up all people in culture, not just you and the circle around you. You're going to care about the least in society as Jesus commanded us to do. You're going to visit the prisoner in prison and clothe the naked. And I'm not talking about doing something you, you tick off a task list to placate that angry God as a Christian, having a backpack drive or a homeless feed. I'm talking about living in a way that changes changes the culture around you to care for the least in culture, that if you see systemic racism, you say, as somebody connected with heaven, I have to care about that. I'm not going to try to find some way, some terminology like socialism or CRT or something that gives me a pass to not give a shit about people. I'm going to care because I am connected to something amazing of the divine that drives me to care about all of humanity, not just those that look and think and, and talk like me. We entered into a bad covenant and a bad belief system, and we perpetuate that bad belief system on young men like me in that video, praying that Jesus won't come while I'm listening to a rock and roll song, because if he does, I'm going to have to make an eternal decision of whether to take the mark of the beast and, and go to hell forever so I can eat on earth. Or as a 12-year-old say, yeah, cut my head off so I can go to heaven and be in eternal heaven. It is a stupid, bad, non-biblical, pharisaical belief system, American evangelicalism today. But what's being offered here? Hebrews 10, I will write my laws on your hearts and minds. It's saying when we walk in partnership with heaven, we're going to know innately inside of us, goodness is going to be drawn out of us. And, and we're going to start to walk away from the worst parts of ourselves and walk towards the best parts of ourselves. When we truly understand what this relationship between heaven and earth, it's not about praying a prayer and not going to hell. It's about saying, let it be on earth as it is in heaven, and let's advance that kingdom so that people can experience and taste this goodness. And we go to our enemies and say, let us come with a hand of friendship. Because the best way to win the war against our enemies is to make them our friends. And the best way to beat the people around us that are so terrible is to show them a better way to live. At least that was what Jesus taught. I know Christians have quit following Jesus a long, long time ago because now we're following sort of this partisan right-wing religious system rather than Jesus. 
But if you truly read the Gospels and the story of Jesus, say, let's put Paul aside for a second and let's just read the story of Jesus. You'll see that he lived and demonstrated and taught a very different life than right wing Christianity. And so I bless you to know that there is a different way to live than evangelical Christianity and the very bad story of God is a pissed God walking around telling us, be better, hate the people that I hate, and us saying, yeah, God, great, we want you to hate the people that we hate. The story is much better than human beings have taken it and corrupted it with their religious belief system. And it's actually in the Protestant scripture. You have perverted the gospel. So I bless you to know that there's something better than the bad theology and bad teaching of the Christian religion. We don't have to live that way. We don't have a pissed off God that we have to placate and manipulate others to bring into our belief system in order to make that God abide us, allow our stench into the room. That's a bad, bad story. And it's not the story of the Western Bible. Thank you for listening to my Bible talk. Blessings to you.